All right. So I think we're ready to get started. So hello once again, everybody. My name is Jeff. Thanks for being here today. Uh, we have the real great uh, pleasure to be joined by one of our academy researchers who's going to be telling us a little bit about his work. Uh, at this, at this, uh, this program called Chat with an Academy Scientist does take place once a week. Um, we get to explore the specific lives of, our, of the variety of researchers that we have based here at the academy uh, and understand a little bit more about their work that often doesn't get featured in a lot of the really cool other exhibits we have here on the floor. Uh, we also do film these and stream them live online. So if you like what you see and you can't make it back to the Academy next time, you can, uh, you can actually watch these online on our Ustream site. Um, you can ask us more later about that if you'd like. But uh, for now, can we all give our special guest, Zarai Lemziget, a big round of applause and a thank you for coming today. It's a real pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for being here, Zarai. How are you course. doing? I'm good. How are you? All right. Very good. Okay. So um, yeah, we're going to be talking uh, quite a bit about Zarai's work, which is related to uh, human evolution and um, the work that he's done in the Ethiopian deserts, kind of uncovering the secrets and the mysteries uh, related to that. So Zarai, can you tell us, uh, first of all, in, in, your, in, in your words, what, what is your work? What are you most interested in? And how did you first develop that interest? Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, I'm so happy to be here, as always. It's just I like the, the name of the program, chat, yeah. with, chat with, for you to chat with the scientists, for me to chat with the public. So <laughs> there's nothing better that can happen to a scientist than chatting with the, with the public. So, uh, because ultimately what we try to do is really find something, learn about it, and th teach the public. So that's how we then can go to the next step of knowing who we are and where we come from and many other questions. Uh, my job is very easy, actually. It's about uh, humans. So the subject of study of my work is to look at myself and you guys and our ancestors over the past six to seven million years. So uh, looking into what makes us human and how we became who we are today is the very question that uh, intrigues me and for which I go to very remote places, including the deserts of Ethiopia, Kenya, and even Chile. I was there recently, oh yeah. actually, to look for the hard evidence and then find, uh, try to address the question of what makes us human. So that would be my, my, my work. And how did you first kind of develop your interest in that? Uh, as a kid, I liked biology and history, which if you put them together, what we do is a biological history of humans. So. I then joined the university, studied uh, geology, because if you're interested in ancient humans, you're going to work on fossils, and where do you find the fossils? In the rocks. So the combination of geology, biology, and history was uh, the thing that somehow triggered the interest that uh, I am so much involved with today. Right. Yeah. Very good. All right. Well, I guess to kind of start things off for, for providing context, you know, we often uh, talk about and understand the fact that we're primates and yeah. that we're closely related to other animals like chimps yeah. and other primates. Can you tell us, first of all, what specifically do we share with those species, those animals, yeah. and, and what kind of sets us apart? What makes us human? That, that's a very good question because when, when I said, well, I'm interested in what makes us human, so one can ask, therefore, wh where do you start to address that question? And then the way to start it is, who is the closest species or animal to humans today? Anyone, any, can you tell me? Apes, and specifically chimpanzees. So the best way to start for me is, then how are we different from chimpanzees, for example? And when we look at that, we can look at it in terms of the biology or the behavior, the culture. So when you try to trace back uh, what makes us human, it's a matter of looking into who we are and how we are distinguished from other species, for example, the chimpanzees. And if you compare a human and a chimpanzee, there are some very clear differences. First of all, we walk upright, they don't. We have a big brain, they don't. We can make, make tools. I'm not using, saying use, they, we can make tools, they can't. And then we have the sophisticated technology of building the Academy of Sciences. They don't. So there are a series of differences. There are key attributes that define us as to who we are and why we are different from other creatures. And when you actually dive into those issues and try to look at them in a temporal fashion, like following 
at the time frame and when appeared what, you see that we started to be an upright species, upright walking species, maybe sometime around seven to six million years ago. We started to use the very first tools sometime around 3.5 million years ago. We became uh, the animal with the type of body proportion that I have today and you have today sometime around 1.8 million years ago. And we emerged as a distinct species, Homo sapiens, around 200,000 years ago. And we became the uh, symbolic species that we are today, and by that I mean a species that is not only interested in what it eats or plays with, but in how it's perceived from the outside. Look at yourself. I have a jacket, I have a shirt, I have uh, maybe beads, and uh, you know many of us have all sorts of things on our, on our, our bodies. We don't use that, or we don't do that out of necessity. You don't need beads or ornaments or dyes or tattoos for your survival. But we have become the symbolic species, maybe because of the big brain, that has made us even doubt the fact that we are animals. So this very complex series of events starting from the very first upright workers all the way to the symbolic species that we are today and trying to fill in the gap by looking into the fossil ev evidence is basically what I do and right. what makes me a paleoanthropologist. Gotcha. And the process that you just recently described, that you just described just now, uh, <laughs> is often captured in kind of popular cartoons like this uh, that are fun to look at and kind of give us a little perspective of who we are yeah. and where we've come yeah. from. But uh, sometimes they can also confuse us as far as, you know, they might imply that we actually descended directly from a chimpanzee, for example. Yeah. But um, can you tell us a little bit about how actually that whole process works yeah. and how the other primates that we're related to that are yeah. currently living yeah. kind of come about as well? So wh when we say that we're very close to the chimpanzees, uh, obviously we're not saying we descended from the chimpanzees. No serious scientist has said that ever. We did not descend from any extant living species that we have today. The chimpanzees and humans have a common ancestor that might have existed sometime prior to seven million years. And because today we happen to be the only hominin species, human species that is existing on the planet Earth, we consider ourselves to be so unique that we have hard time even inserting ourselves or putting ourselves in the, into the animal world, into the animal kingdom. But if you even trace back your ancestry to <laughs> 30,000 years ago, there were three hominin species roaming the landscape of the planet Earth. We had the Neanderthals, we had the hobbits in Indonesia, and the Denisovans somewhere in Siberia. So we had at least four species only 30,000 years ago. Push back in time, only 500,000 years ago, we had Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, and uh, some robust species. So at any given time, human ancestors were not represented by single species that today, as you know, has a population size that stands at seven billion individuals, which is unheard of for any primate species. But what's amazing at the same time, I think, to me, is the type of genetic diversity that is almost identical if you were to compare an individual of a human species and another human species, whereas in, in chimpanzees uh, uh, it's very high. We can talk about that later. But coming back to this picture, uh, this is a nice notion if you think only in terms of progression and succession of species across time. So if you say we have that line that represents our ancestry all the way back to seven million years ago. Yes, there is that line. But when you are like myself looking into the diversity of species in time over the past six million years ago, this is a rather simplistic representation or depiction of the facts. As I said, at any given time, we had several, at least a few species represented in our family known as the hominins. So, there were many dead end species, for example. There is a group of species called the robust Australopithecus species that got uh, their demise, I think, 1.2 million years ago. 
the Neanderthals died out, died out 30,000 years ago. The habits in Indonesia died out 18,000 years ago. So this actually does not represent the actual happenings uh, when we look into the history of human evolution. So when you think of human evolution, it's very important to look into obviously that line because that links you to the animal world, but you were not alone at a given time. There, was, there were a diversity of species. There were multiple species at a given time. So looking into human evolution is not a matter of looking into that line. It's a matter of looking into what complex history or story led to our being now the only species that, again, I, as I said, uh, has over 7 billion individuals, right. even though no other primate in its history had this number of individuals in its species. Right. And um, for your work, in order to kind of study the uh, variety of species that you're talking about, the variety of ancestors that we've had over time, a lot of your work has focused on Kenya and yeah. Ethiopia. What makes those areas really good spots for you to go out and try to search for these types yeah. of fossils? Well, first of all, if you look at the distribution of primates today, think of any monkey looking, any primate, or any ape. They are restricted within the tropics. And that really tells you one clear thing. You are a tropical species. So we're not supposed to go out of the tropics. Why are we out of the tropics? Because we are homo sapiens. Why are we homo sapiens? Because we pass through those stages of evolution that made us this tool making, tool using, exceptionally unique species that then helped us to venture into not only beyond the tropics, but also to the temperate zones, to the polar zones, and even to other planets, as you know today. So the fact that you find yourself in Alaska or Antarctica does not mean that you really belong there. You belong there because of the technology that you have. But if you were to describe yourself as a primate, then you are an African, a tropical primate. Uh, therefore, when you go back to the times when we did not have the technology that we have today, we obviously were tropical species, particularly African species. Why? Because that area was favorable for the flourishment of the species. But when we go to those places, there were uh, like three, four, five million years ago, there were uh, lots of rivers, lakes, and the tectonic activity of that region is so unique that not only was it favorable for the survival of those species, but was also very key to the preservation of their remains as fossils. So the combination of being favorable for their survival, because it's within the tropics, but at the same time, the fact that they were really nice, the, the, there were nice rivers and lakes that were favoring the preservation of the remains, unlike many other places, made that area basically a paleoanthropological paradise. So it's a combination of factors that led to the, those, th these places to be uh, very famous for the anthropological research, the type of work that I do. Right. And so those places that in the past had been very lush with rivers and, uh, and lakes and whatnot are now uh, yeah. oftentimes kind of covered in this, this type of environment, the desert. Yeah. So you go to these places looking for the fossils. How do you, out of the broad yeah. landscape that we see pictured yeah. here, how do you prioritize locations to start your digging? And, yeah. and what are you looking for? So when you, you, when you look at a nice book, uh, call it an e-book or a real book, uh, you right away attract attracted when you look at the title or the shape or the old books that are nicely uh, bounded and things like that. When I look at that, for me, it's like an archive. The only difference is this is a sedimentary archive where you are going to find the evidence for a species, be it a human species or a non-human species that has existed prior to 3.4 million years ago. How do I know? See this white band ash here? I know if you can see it from there, there is this white sand that's dated to 3.4 million years ago using the potassium argon or argon argon uh, uh, techniques. So when you have that volcanic ash, and you know the age, and when you walk up the hill, you're not just traveling in space, you're also walking through time. 
So as you start from the bottom going up, you're going to be younger and younger and younger than 3.4 million years old. So when in 2000, I made the discovery of Salam, which is the earliest child ever known in the history of paleoanthropology, I think it must have been somewhere around here. I was the only scientist on site, but right away I was able to say, oh, this find should be should not be much younger than 3.4 million years ago. And the reason why I said that was because this sediments I know post-date this volcanic ash, but not by too much. So when, when we walk, therefore, through the sediments, we're, we're, we're uh, walking through time. We know what ages are represented and the type of the sediment type of sediments that are potentially of interest for the type of work we do. Right. So you can read these rocks that in short. Yeah. And then and then when you kinda get down into the nitty gritty you're using you're using tools to kind of very carefully remove these yeah. items. Um, what does that work look like and, and who are the people who are helping yeah. you? Yeah. So when when you go to the sites, uh, uh, it's it's frustrating to 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 explain that moment of discovery simply because it's not the moment that you go and you find something. It's a part of a long uh, standing project that lasts hours and hours, days and days and years and after years and after years. But when you go to the site, what you normally find are remains of animals. It could be like elephants here, pigs, antelopes, uh, uh, all sorts of primates and uh, uh, mammals, uh, but you can ask w how can a rhino or a big hippopotamus or a crocodile or an, uh, an elephant live in this barren, empty land? Well, the answer is there uh, because three, four, five million years ago, the, the, the type of environment that prevailed on this landscape was drastically different from what you have today. So for me, uh, the issue of uh, environmental change and uh, uh, that temperature is changing and all that uh, is not something I need to read a book on. It's a matter of going to the sites, which are empty, barren, and dry today, but then finding an elephant or a hippopotamus in the middle of the desert simply tells you that the environment had changed in it. What is the degree and others? You know, we can talk about that, but the environment is changing drastically. So you work with these locals, obviously, who occupy the, the, the area, because without their gui guidance and their uh, security that they offer, work would be very hard to undertake uh, the sites. And you need people. Uh, I am uh, the paleo anthropologist of the project and the leader of the project, but you need geologists like John Wayne, who is from Florida, and then you need an archaeologist. You need a paleo environmentalist. So when you go there, it's like uh, not only taking a team of researchers, a multidisciplinary team of researchers, but because there is nothing waiting for you there, it's like carrying a village with you uh, when you go there. Like up to 40 people, you have to go there under the tent for two months, so you basically are carrying a village in addition to seven to 10 scientists who are going to be expertise in all sorts of uh, 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 fields of sciences and right. anthropology. Yeah. And you previously mentioned uh, one of your discoveries that you've made, I think it was in the year 2000, yeah, yeah. which was a, a really important discovery. It was, you say it was the, the oldest uh, child Dying, yeah. found in our, in our family. Wh what, what, how, do, how do you know and how do you actually analyze a, a fossil like this to kind of find information out about the species? And, and what, what else is the significance yeah, of that? Yeah. Uh, th this fossil uh, was published actually uh, in Nature in 2006, but also on the cover page of National Geographic uh, in November of 2006. Uh, it's a, a three years old child uh, that died 3.3 million years ago. So that volcanic ash I showed you earlier is just below the spot where we found this fossil. So that's why and how I know right away that the fossil should not be much different from 3.4. And then it turns out when the geologist, Jonathan Wynn, did the, the analysis, it was 3.32 million years. We can be that precise. Mm. So this fossil represents a child uh, that belongs to the species known as Australopithecus afarensis, and that is a Lucy species that lived between 3.8 and 2.9 million years ago. 
So by the way, one thing when we think of ourselves as a very successful species occupying all these planets and going even beyond, we were born only 200,000 years ago. So we have made it 200,000. This primitive species made it for 800,000 years. The very robust species that got it d its demise 1.2 million years ago survived for 1 million years. So we have 800 years to go if we are going to call ourselves more derived or more modern or more civilized than those creatures, just uh, 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 to make that point. But then this fossil, what you have in this fossil is not only the head, it's not only the, the, the lower jaw. You have a series of vertebra uh, the spinal column, the vertebrae they are called, uh, which are completely, uh, the, the preservation is unprecedented. Even Lucy, the famous Lucy, you know, if you really think, you don't have the face. You have the lower part of the skeleton, which is 40% complete, but we, unfortunately, they were not able to find the face. What you have here is you have the face, you have the skull, you have everything. In addition, you have 60% of the skeleton represented and belongs to a child. So why is that important? Well, because children, because they are fragile, the bones are not completely formed, not completely fused, and the, they are uh, prime candidates for the predators or the scavengers, they don't really make it to the fossil record. So this, fos this fossil was so exceptional, not only in terms of its preservation, but also because it belongs to a child. And when you have access to the children, you have a new window of research to look into childhood and how they change it when they were, uh, when, they, when they passed from, from being a child to the adult individuals. So all those questions can be addressed thanks to this type of fossils. Yeah. Right. Uh, another d important discovery you made more recently uh, was actually discovery of a bone that isn't a human bone or, yeah. a, or a relative of humans, was an animal bone, but it looked like it had been um, carved into with some kind of yeah. tool. So can you tell us a little bit more about that discovery too? Yeah, let's put this in, in a context. First of all, this, this, this discovery also was published on the cover page of Na Nature, which, which, which tells you a little bit about its significance. Uh, it's very important. So you can ask, why was uh, nature interested in publishing these two fragmentary bones? One comes from, uh, I think, a buffalo-sized cattle animal. It's a rib bone. And the second comes from a, a thigh bone of a, a gazelle. Uh, so basically a goat-sized animal. So if you see closely, you have uh, two marks right here. And then it's peppered with all sorts of marks on it. These two pictures, these two pictures are those, 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 those marks that you see on top. So in short, let, let me conclude. What we said based on this find is that Tullius, which is a hallmark in human evolution, dates back to 3.4 million years ago. That's the claim we made. And how did we then at the, at the, at the time advance the, the knowledge that we had at time. At that time, the, the earliest evidence for tools was 2.5 million years, and then the earliest evidence for the stone tool themselves was 2.6 million years ago. So we are saying, no, tools happened at least 800,000 prior to that evidence, that the evidence that we had at the time. Is that clear? I'm just making the context clear for the time there. Now, so when we said, Stone tool actually use dates back to 3.4 million years. We were saying that tool use is not unique to the genus Homo, because at the time, around 2.5 million years ago, we have the genus Homo. So, purposely or not, scientists were attributing tool use to our genus Homo. Even the famous Homo habilis is named because it was thought at the time to be the sole tool user, Homo habilis. If you know Latin, habil means to be able. So Homo habilis means the tool user uh, human or something like that. So with that notion, it was very hard to actually push the, the, the earliest evidence for tool use to 3.4. So th there, was, there were some resistance. Uh, that's one thing. Second, at around 3.4 million years, 
ago, when we think this fossils date back to, there is only one species, and that is Australopithecus afarensis, the Lucy species or the Salam species, and that was considered to be too primitive to be using tools. So we were, f the, 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 the facts that this discovery was very uh, influential, it's because we are saying not only tool use is not restricted to homo, but we're saying Australopithecus afarensis used tools to carve meat of the bones. But if you really think about it, chimpanzees with very small brain, primitive hand, and then the type of mode of locomotion they have, they do use tools. They use uh, sticks to fish for termites. They do use stones to try to crack nuts. So th the notion that the species were too primitive to be able to, u to, 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 to use tool is somehow related to the notion of defining the genus Homo as Homo habilis. So I think this research and the dis discovery has opened a new window in which we are going now to look into the time periods that predate the emergence of our genus Homo and find evidence, at least the precursors of tool use and tool making that date back to over three million years ago. So in, 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 in sum, what this find tells us is that tool use was not restricted to the genus Homo. Tool use can date back to 3.5 million years ago. And then if you look at the chimpanzees using tools, our ancestors using tools should not come as a surprise. And you mentioned that this is kind of this was a controversial discovery, really changing our understanding yeah. of tool use. But uh, this this research was only published a couple of years ago. So is this still controversial in your field? Or, are 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 you slowly having to win people over to your argument? No. Uh, first of all, uh, it was not really uh, people commented, but if it did not pass through the peer review process, you wouldn't have seen it on the cover page of Nature. So there are two things. There are uh, th 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 there is the evidence, which is obviously accepted and published in Nature, but the second part is there are people who somehow had the record for the earliest tools right. or for the earliest cut market bones who will continue to resist yeah. on the authenticity of. So my point now is not really to argue with those people. My point is to go find more of those and then see that what we're saying is statistically valid. That would be right. my next frontier of research. Right. Yeah. And so what are your, your, your upcoming expeditions? What, what are, what's your future research going to be over the next year, year or two? Oh, well, uh, actually, I just came back uh, from, from, from Germany, where I was working at the, at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, when, when we do our work, we're not just looking wor uh, at works that are done in the field but also we do lo lots of analysis uh, with using uh, medical uh, facilities right. such as the CT scan technology, the synch synchrotron technology, to actually look beyond what you can see uh, you know, with your naked eyes. So what I was doing uh, in Germany was really processing uh, close to 10 terabytes of data of uh, many, many fossils to try to see, for example, uh, the child I showed you. I told you she died when she was three, right? But don't be surprised if in a year or two, I came back and published something that will say, well, this child was not three, but she was two years, five months, two days. <laughs> we have now that capacity to actually do that. And that's what, 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 that's what I was doing in Germany. If you ask me, how do you do that? Well, you know the three rings. You can count three rings and then tell their ages. Same thing happens in our teeth. So you can actually go deep into the teeth that are still growing in the uh, jaws of this child. And then you can count the daily uh, growth lines. By counting that, you can tell this individual died when she was uh, three years, two months, and five days. Uh, and, and really, that's not just about the numbers. If you have that number, then you can say, so how much of the brain was then developed at that age? And if you have that number again, you can link it. So the pattern of brain growth, the pattern of brain development in this species was more human-like or ape-like. That can help you interpret their behavior, whether childhood was existing or not. So you can answer all sorts of questions by simply having access to the age at death of this individual. So that's what I was doing. 
in the lab, and then I'm going to back to uh, Ethiopia to that site, as I said, to find more of the cut market bones or evidence for the stone tools, for example, if they are out there. Right. All right. Well, very best of luck on that work. Thank you. I would love to open it up to some questions from all of you. Uh, if you have any questions for Zarai about what we've talked about today. Um, or any questions about human evolution. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mm. Right. So, so this visitor is commenting on the kind of the big gap in intelligence between, for example, a chimp and a human, and wondering ab about where is the where is the, the 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 species that's in the middle? Wh wh why isn't there more of a spectrum there? Yeah. Well, uh, there are two questions. Uh, uh, the p the point you make obviously is you know obviously an astounding difference between chimps and humans. Uh, but those differences, at the same time, are to be tempered by really defining what we mean by intelligence. Uh, I always give this slightly silly example when uh, people say, you know, we are smarter than the fish. Well, yeah, but let's put a human and a fish in the sea and we will see who is smarter. You know, if it's a matter of survival, if it's a matter of perpetuating your genes to the next generation. It's a, if it's a matter of fitness, which is everything about natural selection and the evolution, then uh, that, that can be debated. But if you narrow it down, yes, that's right, but within that group of species, the stri difference, striking difference between humans and chimpanz chimpanzees is really fascinating. And to partly answer your question, when you look at humans today with all these buildings, the iPhones, and then go back 200, 200 years, less, and then if you trace back, you will find the very first stone tools, and then if you go back, you will find the very first upright worker. So the transition is there. That's one thing. Second, so, so that means you, c you may consider that transition to be the spectrum by looking into the different stages of, say, stone tool making. The very first are very crude uh, choppers. If you go to 1.5 million years ago, you have this very beautifully made Acheulean bifaces. If you go further in time into 200,000 years, you have this very nice flakes. And then you have the bread lids. And then you have agriculture. And then you have cars, etc. Et so the spectrum is there. But the other side of the answer to that question is, Chimpanzees are different from humans, not, not just in terms of their intelligence, but also in terms of their uh, adaptation. So why do we have such a huge difference in intelligence between humans and chimpanzees is because they are two different species adapted to completely different situations. But the spectrum, however, that you uh, very rightly asked for is to be found if we trace back our ancestry back in time the way I do it, for example. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's a uh, very interesting question. All right, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Mm. Well, culture for me is defined, well, actually not defined, but understood uh, as something that you would do to manipulate your environment. For example, before tool use, our very first ancestors were interacting with their environment, with their hands, and with their teeth. By the time we have the evidence for tool use, the type of interaction with their nature has been drastically, dramatically transformed. But then you start to, to try to have access to the, to the carcasses, to the dead animals. But when you do that, it does not come for free because there are scavengers and hyenas that are interested in that same carcass. So when that happens, then you're going to strategize 
and then try to make your group more cohesive so that some of them can chase the hyenas away and some of them can concentrate on the carcasses. And then when you see that, actually, the very first tool that you have is primitive and it's taking you so much time, when you have a pressure from the hyenas and the scavengers, you're going to say, uh, well, why don't you, some of you, maybe you can make a better tool. Then you start the tool making process. And this goes on all the way, all the way, all the way to the iPhone. So the question is, uh, if, if your question is, uh, how is that different from animal culture? Is that, is that what that? Yeah, how can I tell? By finding the hard evidence, such as the stone tools, such as the cut market bones, such as the remains of uh, uh, the actual stone tools themselves. And then when you go further in time, by finding the bronze, in the Bronze Age, you can find the materials, actually. So the answer to your question is, by finding the material culture, you can find that culture existed in, uh, in, uh, in humans all the way back to 3.5 million years ago. But you can ask, yeah, by the way, there is something called primate culture now. Because chimpanzees do use tools. They use sticks to uh, fish for uh, termites in the mounds. But if a tool is made of sticks and not stone tools, it's not going to be preserved in the fossil record. But to me, that's really exciting because tool use in our human, human ancestry could even be older than 3.4. It's just that we're not finding it because they were not using stone tools at that time. So the, the human culture is deeply embedded in the primate culture because when it originated for the first time, it had to have a precursor. It had to have emanated from that primate culture because we are essentially primates as our walking style, as our brain, as our relationship, the relationship that we have, we have between adults and children. So all that combined, name it culture or behavior, uh, makes humans unique, but at the same time makes them part of the primate world, if I answer your question, I think. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Oh, sorry, we both pointed at different people. Okay, you, right, you we'll go here <laughs> first, and then we'll go next. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. So the question is, uh, when you're out there, are you only looking for Australopithecus afarensis? Yeah, and the very simple reason is, if I did that, it would be very boring, and <laughs> I would come back home right away. Because when you go to those sites, uh, I don't know if you were here at the beginning. That nice landscape, it's littered with fossils, but fossils of hippos, fossils of antelopes, fossils of pigs. So if you would to go out there, a number of fossil remains, less than 1% would be belonging to any hominin or human ancestor fossil. So statistically, they don't exist. <laughs> That's why they become so precious, actually, like gold, <laughs> in a way. Mm. But when we go to those sites, we have experts that specialize on hippos, on all sorts of animals. We have a group of paleontologists. And without their work, it would have been very hard to actually have a good picture of what the paleo ancient landscape looked like. So to answer your question, most of what we bring back to the museums are not human fossils. Over 99.1% are non-human fossils. And the next question was over here. Yeah, I didn't hear. Could you repeat the yeah, question? Yeah, uh, her question is a uh, 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 very important question. Demenesi is a site in Georgia, and they have this human ancestors attributed to Homo erectus that are found at the site. And that actually is, interestingly, the earliest fossil human outside of Africa. So it's a very important site. The point she is making, however, is 
okay, if we accept that the Domenici fossils are Homo erectus, but we know that they have many Homo habilis, which is more primitive, Homo habilis-like features, how do we reconcile the, 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 our reservation? I think that's your question. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, there are two answers to that question. The first is, it's not surprising for a daughter species to have preserved characters or attributes that come from the ancestral species. Because when a species transforms into another, it doesn't completely change everything. It's a progressive change, that's one thing. Second, the fact that we have Homo erectus and Homo habilis at the same time is also another possible, though unlikely, possible uh, evolutionary scenario. It's, it's possible for a parent species to have existed here and continue and the population of that species would evolve separately in an allopatric situation, which means in a separate geographic origin. So it could be that the Homo erectus that we have in uh, Georgia might be an offshot of the Homo habilis that then became ancestral to all Homo erectus throughout the world. So either of the, po the, the scenarios would explain, it would answer your question, I think. Sure. Um, I, I, uh, I know that you've mentioned uh, also previously, kind of related to this, uh, the fact that you know, earlier you were saying humans, uh, the, human, the current human species, Homo sapiens, has been around maybe 200,000 years. Other previous relatives have been around for 800,000 or more. Uh, so we're still pretty young. Were there any points in the past 200,000 years where we actually came close to extinction? Yeah. Uh, when you look, uh, I was telling you earlier, we're very closely related to the chimpanzees. And how do we, 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 do, know, how do we know that? Well. When you do the DNA analysis of a chimpanzee and the humans, I think we share over 98.5 or 0.8% of our genetic material is completely the same. So the differences that we have in terms of our genes are just a remaining uh, small portion of the, our genetics. So genetically, we are very similar to the chimpanzees. Second, anatomically speaking also, I know the lack of the tail and many other features, we are chimp-like. It's very hard for us to, 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 uh, uh, to see that because we know we are so experts on identifying faces that we won't be able to tell the difference between the faces of two chimpanzees, even though they are genetically very different. But if any of you can tell the difference between me and Jeff right away like that. We are experts on identifying pe people's face, but the genetic, material between me and Jeff is almost identical. 99.7% is, I think, the same. I can, I, can, I, can, I can change. So the point, the point I'm making here is when, uh, when you look at uh, the chimpanzees and their population size is now, I think it's about 50,000 individuals. I may be wrong. Maybe the gorillas are 150,000 individuals now remaining. And where do we find them other than the zoos? Very narrow window in, in the tropics within Africa. They basically live in a very small portion of our planet. And their population size is very small. But their genetic diversity is huge compared to that of humans. On the other hand, humans occupy the whole planet from the tropics all the way to the northern and southern hemispheres. And our population size is 7 billion. So you would expect the diversity to be huge, but now it's very similar genetically. And why would this be the case? Well, there are two explanations. Well, first of all, humans are very, uh, basically a traveler species. We don't really block gene flow um, within the species. So genes are flowing all the time with the type of uh, mode of locomotion that we have. One can be in Africa today, and the next day in Australia, the other day in North America. So gene flow is constant. But the second point is that when we left Africa 70,000 years ago, once the species Homo sapiens has been formed, we left Africa 70,000 years ago. And I think just prior to that, there was some bottleneck 
something that has caused the population size of humans to go very low, literally dwindled to the scale of tens and twenty thousands of individuals. When you have that reduction of population size caused by some factors, to start with, you are starting with very few individuals. So the descendant populations that you have in Asia, in Americas, in Europe, in Africa are going to be minimal. So that bottleneck, that reduction in population size that has happened prior to the migration could be the cause for this very minimal genetic diversity that we have today in addition to the continuous and constant gene flow that obviously is not stoppable in Homo sapiens. That's a lot. Anybody else want to uh, venture a question? Yes, another one over here. Yes. Oh, actually, I just got two papers to review today, so I'm still thinking about that. Hmm. Uh, What's the question? Uh, Sediba. Okay. What are my thoughts? Australopithecus Sediba, for those of you who may not have heard of it, is a species that was named maybe a year or two years ago. Uh, by an American South Af African scientist, uh, Lee Berger. Uh, and when it was found, it was a kind of a surprise because it dates back to 1.9 million years ago. So at that time, you would expect something that is human-like, so homo-like. But remember, earlier I was telling you, at any given time, we had multiple species in human history. So that they found this strange looking species at 1.9 was not really a big surprise to me. But some of the authors are suggesting that it could be a direct ancestor of the genus Homo. To me, now this is going to be an ex my, my, my scientist's view, my expert's view, I don't think so. It's a very important fossil showing that there were multiple species at 1.9 to 2 million years ago. But if you have Homo already at 2.3, 2.5, and we have specimens that are clearly homo, like at 2.4 million years ago, at 2.3 million years ago in uh, Malawi and in Ethiopia. And you have this very Australopithecus like at 1.9. Homo, homo had already evolved prior to the emergence of Australopithecus sediba. So it, I have a hard time making sediba ancestral to homo. If you do that, then you would have to take the earlier Homo out of the picture of the line that goes to Homo erectus. So the choice you have now is, do you make specimens that are clearly Homo dated to 2.3 ancestral to Homo erectus, or do you make a very Australopithecus-like with a small brain still climbing in trees ancestral to Homo erectus, which is Sediba? The answer for me is the former than the later. So. That, that's my view. <laughs> All right. Any final questions? I like the questions. They're very good. Yeah, questions. great questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are there any theories about the bottleneck that you were speaking yeah, about recently? Yeah, there are theories. Or well, First of all, that migration was happening during the uh, uh, Ice Age. Uh, uh, not the maximum, because the maximum was around 20 to 18,000 years ago. So that, that, that could be somewhere around there as an explanation. But there was this 70,000 years ago, there was this very uh, big volcanic eruption in the Toba, uh, Southern Asia. And there are some people who have tried to explain the bottleneck by attributing it to that volcanic eruption. Uh, I if you ask me, do you have any strong view about that? The answer is no, I don't have any strong view. I think we need to do more, more research, particularly in terms of genetics to link it to some cause. Um, kind of just to conclude here, I'm wondering, Zarai, uh, of course, evolution is ongoing. We're, you know, our species is still evolving now, but we're now kind of at a point, uh, unprecedented, of course, as far as how fast our technologies are developing and our, and our cultures. Uh, so it might be hard to kind of uh, apply a lesson from evolution to where we currently are. But if, if, you, if you could try to do that, uh, what lessons do you think we should learn from uh, uh, as far as where we are now and, and where we need to go in the future in order to make sure that we can Yeah, survive? well, you know, I, I was saying earlier, uh, we had many, many, like up to over 15 species over the past 7 million years ago, all belonging to the group called hominins, 
so closely related to us than they are to the chimpanzees. So I think that's a nice showcase. If we want to experiment what happened, uh, what is going to happen to us, maybe it's good to look at those species and what they've done. Uh, the species Australopithecus afarensis made it for, that is a Lucy species, made it for, uh, this one, not that one. <laughs> 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 made it for over 600,000 years ago. The very primitive species known as Paranthropus robustus or Boisei made it for close to a million years. Neanderthals made it for over 400,000 years. So many of the species that we think are primitive actually were not bad. They, they, they survived for way more than what we have done so far. And they all had one thing in common. They did not alter their environment as much as we do it today. Um, um, uh, this is, you can say this is correlation. And I'm not talking about cause and effect, but that is my observation. One thing they didn't do is they did maybe alter, you know, a tree or something, but they did not alter their environment as much as we are doing it. So I think for me, whether the environment that we are inventing today is going to be good for us or bad for us is to be debated. And that's one thing that we do at the California Academy of Sciences. And the way we do it here is we go to places called pristine and nicely preserved places. I just came, came out of a lecture by uh, one of our curators uh, who works on the island of Principe in Sao Tome. And he was telling us how nicely diversified and preserved those many species are. Not, not, not humans, we're talking about non-human animals. And they have maintained that for over sometimes many, many thousands, millions of years. So uh, take home message for me is, what we do to the environment is going to determine what we are going to be. Right. So if we want to predict what our species is going to be, it's better to predict what we are going to do to the environment. And that will give us a clue. But again, back to our ancestors, with primitive technology and sometimes with no technology, they made it for over sometimes 500, 600,000 years ago. So that would be my... Uh, right. Uh, sort of and wisdom, if you can call and it. Our hope is we can go another 800,000 or more. <laughs> yeah. All right. Can we give Zariah a big round of applause? This has been really fantastic. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. If you would like to uh, ask any final questions, please come on, on up and join us. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day at the Academy of Sciences. And also, uh, please do go over to our exhibit in African Hall, just right over here, which will tell a little bit more about uh, some of the fossils that Zarai has found and other fossils as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>